Hello all, we will give folks a chance to file in here and get started here in just a minute or so. All right, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, begin. Good evening, my name is Renee Nicholson and as director of the Humanity Center at West Virginia University, I am pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, which is a part of our Appalachian Writers of Color series. Uh, tonight's event celebrates the work of Nima Avashia, author of the forthcoming book, Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place. And she will be introduced by the center's writer in residence, Anne Pancake. But before I turn things over to Anne and Nima, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, today's talk is being hosted at, on the Zoom webinar platform, and most likely many of you are probably already familiar with Zoom webinar events. Uh, tonight's event will be recorded and posted on the Center's YouTube channel. We invite you to ask questions uh, for tonight's guests using the Q&A function. And at the end of the reading and formal presentation, I will moderate these questions as time allows. Uh, only answers questions will be made public and the chat function is not enabled for tonight's participants. Uh, at this point, I'd like to turn things over to Ann Pancake. Thank you, Renee. Um, first, I want to thank you all so much for joining us tonight during what I know is a busy and stressful week. Um, it means a lot to us that you're here and, and you're giving us your time. Um, it is my great honor and happiness to introduce you to Nima Avashia, reading from her first book, a collection of essays entitled Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place. I first encountered Nima's essays about a year ago when I was reviewing material for the WVU Press. I opened a file, read the first few sentences, and my jaw dropped. Here was a perspective on Appalachia that I had never read, compellingly and beautifully written. I immediately contacted Nima and asked if I could teach her essay Chemical Bonds to my Appalachian literature students. She said yes, and my students were as moved as I was by this compassionate, nuanced, and original piece about her family's experience as immigrants in West Virginia, and the way that experience intersects with complex environmental and economic issues. A few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to join Nima on an in-person panel for West Virginia K through 12 reading teachers. So not only did I discover what a great human she is, and not only did I get to hear her wonderful essay about playing basketball in Southern West Virginia, I also got to witness how her account of her Appalachia reached this audience as teacher after teacher came up after the panel to tell Nima how much her essay had meant to them and how much they wanted to share her work with their students. And I also had to smile as Nima and the teachers in that West Virginia way figured out how they knew someone who knew someone who knew Nima back in the day. Nima Avashio was born and raised in Cross Lanes, West Virginia to parents who immigrated from India to the Kanawha Valley to work in the chemical industry. She graduated from Carnegie Mellon with joint degrees in writing and history. For the last 19 years, she has been a teacher and a teacher activist in the Boston public schools. She lives in Boston with her partner, Laura. When she's not teaching, you can find her cooking, writing, or reading. I can also tell you that her favorite tutor's biscuit is potato with cheese. Before I turn things over to Nima, I want to quote what she told me about her hopes for her book, which will be published in March by WVU Press. She wrote me, I do hope that the book offers another rendering of an Appalachian story, most importantly for folks who live there and live in the many another's, but also for folks from outside whose understanding of our home is so limited. Uh, join me in welcoming Nima Avashia. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, Anne, for that wonderful introduction. That's super generous of you. And thanks, everybody, for being here. I'm loving uh, looking at the participants tab here and seeing folks from college, seeing folks from growing up, 
in Cross Lanes, West Virginia, seeing folks from my Boston life. Um, it's pretty amazing seeing folks from WVU, seeing all these worlds intersect um, is maybe the best thing about Zoom in the context of so many things that are hard about Zoom. So I'm so grateful for you all for being here with me tonight. And I'm really excited to share a little bit from my book with you. This is the kind of first official reading for another Appalachia. So that's also exciting and uh, especially meaningful, I think, to be able to do this in the context of WVU. One of the most powerful things for me about this process has been being able to publish my book with the press from home. Um, I can't say how much it means that folks at home see these stories as ones that resonate for them. Uh, it's kind of the, the most rewarding thing about this process so far. Um, as we're getting started, I just, I'm a teacher and I, I can't not teach a little bit in the context of, uh, of, of doing a Zoom. It's like habit at this point. Um, and so I just wanted to ground us in a little bit of context. So I just want you to take a second to look at this first image and think about what you notice and what you wonder as you look at this first picture. See if you can find me in that picture. Um, see if, what else you notice as you look at this picture. This is a picture of my kindergarten class at Point Harmony Elementary School. I'm pretty sure my mom could tell me if I'm wrong, but I think this is kindergarten. Um, and I wanted you to kind of think about this in terms of locating me as a young child growing up in Appalachia, what that might've looked like um, for me in the day-to-day -day in school. And then I also wanted to show you a second image, which is this image. And again, I want you to just think a little bit about what you notice and what you wonder as you look at this picture of tons of people who are super important to me in my life, um, aunties and uncles from this very small but very close-knit Indian community in the commu place where I grew up. Um, on the backdrop of Babcock Mill State Park, which is a beautiful state park in Southern West Virginia. If you haven't been there, you should go there. But again, think about what you notice and what you wonder as you look at that image. These images are not typical. You don't often see images where in a class there's only one young person of color. And you don't often see people who look like my family and my community on a backdrop of rural, natural wonders in West Virginia. And that's part of what I'm trying to do in the telling of my story is to talk about what these experiences were like. And I only have these experiences because my parents made a journey from Gujarat, which is a state in, in Western India, to West Virginia in the early 70s. Um, my dad got a job at Union Carbide and in Institute West Virginia. And so they made the decision to move there largely for work. But what that meant for me growing up is I lived at a lot of different intersections. Um, I was a child of immigrants in Appalachia. I was Hindu in a space that was majority Christian. I was brown in spaces that were majority white. I was a Chemical Valley kid in what generally is known as coal country. Um, and I was sort of trying to figure out my identity as a person who was queer in places that were largely straight. And so in this book, Another Appalachia, Coming Up Queer and Indian in a Mountain Place, I write essays that try to grapple with all these different intersections of identity, how all these different elements of my background and my being kind of collided and came together in different ways. And this book is gonna be published by WVU Press. Um, it'll be on shelves March 1st, 2022. But tonight I wanted to just read you two essays from the collection to give you a little bit more of a sense of my growing up and my identity as an adult and how coming of age in Appalachia shaped all of that. So the first essay I'm gonna to read to you is a short one and it's on the warmer side. It's called Be Like Wilt. And then the second essay is a little bit heavier, but uh, we'll make it through both and then we'll have time for questions from you. So I'm gonna start with this first essay. It is called Be Like Wilt. I stand on the foul line at the Cross Lanes Methodist Church gym. I am nine, the only girl playing on an all boys basketball team. The only brown kid on a team of white boys. My puny arms, thick glasses, and long oiled braids set me even further apart from their wiry muscular bodies and cropped blonde haircuts. I just did stop sharing, forgot. Why has Carl Bradford chosen me for his team? I wonder about this. His sons are two of the quickest, highest scoring players in our local league. In 1988, in Cross Lanes, West Virginia, there is no designated league for girls. And when I try out one Saturday in October, there are only two other girls in the gym with close to 80 boys. 
tryouts in this pre-hyper competitive era involve dribbling up and down the court and shooting two layups and a couple of foul shots. Every kid is guaranteed a space on a team. The question is simply which coach will choose to take them on. Each girl is selected for a different team. Some teams have no girls. Mr. Bradford doesn't have to pick me, but he does anyway. In doing so, he also takes on the responsibility of chauffeuring me to and from practices and games. Basketball is not a sport my immigrant parents understand, and the parental time commitment it requires is not something their lives leave space for. By opting to play, I take a step further away from my nuclear family and closer to my West Virginia community. Still, my Indian genetics make me short, weak, and terribly uncoordinated. When I shoot the ball overhand, it falls short of the basket by several feet. When I play defense, my teammates say I look like a praying mantis, my hands weaving in front of me instead of out to the sides. I love the game, but I'm about as far from a natural talent as my parents' hometown in India is from this gym at the end of Frontier Drive. One evening, Mr. Bradford proposes that I shoot the ball a different way. Not overhand as I've been trying to, but underhand, granny style my teammates disparagingly call it. Some of the greatest basketball players of all time shot underhand Nima, Mr. Bradford says. Wilt Chamberlain shot underhand. His blue eyes magnified by round wire rim glasses probe mine. In my adult life, I have listened to entire podcasts about the accuracy of the granny shot, about how Walt, Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points in the one game where he shot free throws underhand and Rick Barry's career free throw percentage was a chart topping 89.3 because he opted to do the same. But at age nine, I feel like this is yet another way in which I am being set apart from my peers. Raised by fathers who were players of the game, taught to play at driveway hoops as soon as they could walk, they can shoot overhand. I cannot. How do you assimilate into the dominant culture when your own culture is so invisible to the majority? My small group of Indian peers and I answer this question in different ways. The only Indian boy at my elementary school, who all of the white kids either think is my brother or insist that I should date, speaks with an exaggerated twang, drinks heavily through high school, and loudly votes Republican later on. Some of the Indian kids who live in the city of Charleston emulate their wealthy white classmates, picking up tennis or golf as entry points into American culture. As for me, I choose basketball. I play the sport constantly, watch it obsessively on the TV in our basement, and rock my satin, turquoise and purple Charlotte Hornets jacket daily. And not simply because I love the game. I do, but basketball is more than just a sport to me. It's my way into a world where I otherwise don't seem to belong. I blush hard at the suggestion to shoot underhand, dribble a basketball against the white linoleum flooring of the gym, and stare at the black curve of the key instead of making eye contact with Mr. Bradford. I know he's right, but I'm not sure I can find the courage to shoot granny style in a game where all of my teammates and classmates from school will be watching. Much later in his career, Chamberlain explained why he only shot underhand for one season and reverted to the less accurate overhand free throw afterwards. I felt silly, like a sissy shooting underhanded, he said. I know I was wrong. I know some of the best foul shooters in history shot that way. I just couldn't do it. Even though I haven't heard this explanation in 1988, I struggle with the same sentiment. Eventually, however, my desire to make a basket overwhelms my fear of judgment. Game day comes, the point guard gets the ball into my hands, and I position the ball between my legs before hurling it upwards. Swish. It isn't a buzzer beater. It's not the game-winning shot. It is just two points scored midway through the third quarter in a regular season game. But the entire gym erupts in cheers, the crowd chanting my name. Someone even calls my mom from the payphone in the corner. I grow dizzy with this temporary but overwhelming sense of belonging. So dizzy that I fail to register the final score. After the game, Mr. Bradford gives me his slow, sweet smile. See, Nima, it doesn't matter how you shoot the ball. It just matters that the ball goes in. Mr. Bradford drafts me for his team each of the next three years. At the end of my last season, he persuades all the coaches to jointly award me the league's heart and hustle trophy, given not to the most talented player, but to the most dedicated team member. 
It remains to this day, the award I cherish most. When I age out of his league, he recruits me as an assistant coach for his younger son's team. His red Jeep Cherokee is a fixture outside our house at least three days a week as he continues to drive me to and from practices and games. Each evening after practice, we drive over Goff Mountain. The headlights of the Jeep cast the only light on the dark and winding road that takes us past a pungent chemical landfill and through a dense stand of trees. Close your eyes now, he commands as we approach the summit of the mountain. In the back seat, the boys and I giggle and grin, close our eyes, take a deep breath. Mr. Bradford hits the gas and we soar over the first hill, our stomachs dropping roller coaster style. The Jeep bounces hard on the concrete, then takes flight again as we hit the second decline. For this brief moment, we are Bo, Luke, and Daisy in the General Lee. Our screams of delight replace the sounds of Dixie in this reimagined Dukes of Hazard, and I am wildly, freely American in a way I can never recapture outside of Mr. Bradford's presence. That's one essay. It's a little bit on the warmer side. The second essay is a little bit heavier, but I, th I think you can handle it. It's called Our Armor. One, my mother's morning preparations always took the same form. She emerged from the bathroom after her shower, the air around her perfumed by a heady mix of talcum powder and baby oil. Dressed in a blouse and petticoat, the softness of her belly just spilled over the tightness of the drawstring waist. From my perch on her bed, I watched her get ready for the day ahead, following her movements through her reflection in the mirror. First, she mercilessly attacked the knots in her waist length hair with a plastic comb, then used her slender fingers to divide the hair into three equal sections, which she braided without looking, only pulling the braid over her shoulder when her arms could no longer reach far enough down her back. Next, she wrapped a sari around her body, pleating and draping six yards of silk with a tailor's precision. Last, she put on her ornaments, thin gold bangles that jangled solidly on her wrists, small gold hoop earrings, a black and gold pearl mongol sutra around her neck, a black mascara chan low on her forehead. Ensemble complete, she stepped out of our home and into the wilds of small town West Virginia. In such a foreign context, she opted to own her foreignness rather than hide it on her walks to school, at her job as an accountant, during her service on the board of the local library as the troop leader for the Girl Scouts. The Chanlo was the marker of marriage for Indian women of my mother's generation. It has many names, Tilak and Bindi are the two most common, but in Gujarati, Chanlo is the preferred one. Placed between the eyebrows at the site of the sixth chakra, it is said to represent the third eye and the notion of hidden wisdom. Indian women in India mark their heads with vermilion powder or with tiny stickers in a multitude of shapes, colors, and designs to match each of their saris. For my mother, none of those options were available. There was no Indian grocery store where she could purchase vermilion or sheets of chanlo stickers. So she did what immigrants in America always do to survive. She modified, bought mascara from Rite Aid, perfected the art of drawing a tiny black circle on her forehead with a fuzzy curvy brush, never left the house unmarked. By midday, the chanla would begin to crust, crumbling bits of mascara landing on her cheeks or chin. My mother carried her mascara in her purse. Even at the height of tax season with its 16 hour work days, at first sign of crumble, she would take a moment to go to the bathroom, wash off the remains of the mascara and reapply, determined to keep her third eye intact. I used to think my mother was an embarrassment. Her silky clothes and glittering jewelry contrasted so sharply with the hairspray stiffened perms and acid washed mom jeans of my classmates' mothers. Our brownness in a white world already marked us as other. Why did she need to heighten the distinction? In Jersey City around this time, white supremacists, self proclaimed dot busters, chased Indian women down the street, beat them when they caught them. The way to stay safe, I thought, was to blend in. And my dazzling mother, dazzling in both her style and her personality, never blended in to the bland linoleum and polyester environs of 1980s West Virginia. I shocked my mother when she spoke to me in Gujarati in public, its pitch and tone so different from that of English. Speak English, I would demand, refusing to acknowledge her if she wouldn't. 
Children can be so cruel, the saying goes, and I was living proof. I curse my cruelty now when I can't find the vocabulary in Gujarati to communicate complex ideas. Or when I wear a sari and my mother's response is that I look weird because she can't reconcile my short hair with traditional clothing. I want to believe that my message of assimilation pushed so strongly on my mother was born of my need for safety, both my own and my mother's. But this safety came at tremendous cost. My mother saris now gather dust in her closet, only worn on the most special of occasions. Two, Pamela Circle was never a flag-waving neighborhood in the 80s and 90s. My, neighborhood's, my neighbor's yards did not boast flagpoles. Their porches lacked flag holders. Flapping American flags were flown in schoolyards, not front yards. Flapping Confederate flags were flown in yards in other neighborhoods I learned very early not to trespass through. But on my street, the main morning sounds were those of birds chirping and basketballs pounding on the pavement, not red, white, and blue bunting flapping in the breeze. Until late September in 2001, that is, when my parents took a trip to Portland, Oregon. They sat in a rental car at a stoplight downtown when a group of white men approached, banged on the hood, and rocked the car. The men screamed epithets and curses and the favorite phrase of white supremacists everywhere hurled at those of us who are not white. Go back to where you came from. The light changed. My father slammed the gas pedal, charging forward, unconcerned about whether he ran over anyone's feet in the process. Later that same fall, on a Greyhound bus in Logan, West Virginia, less than an hour from our home, white passengers tackled an older Indian man and pinned him to the floor. They viewed his frequent trips to the bathroom as suspicious instead of being the result of a failing prostate. They only removed their knees from his back when police arrived to take him off the bus. For 25 years, precisely the same amount of time he had spent living in India, my father had worked to make West Virginia feel like home. And then any glimmer of insider status he had gained in two and a half decades evaporated between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. on September 11, 2001. After their trip, my father promptly went to Casto Hardware and purchased a massive American flag decal emblazoned with the saying, proud to be an American. He taped it to our glass front door, leaving sticky residue marks of many crooked attempts before he felt satisfied that it was straight. Another flag got taped into the back windshield of his blue Toyota van. A third got placed in a holder on the porch. 640 miles away in Madison, Wisconsin, I compulsively went across the street every afternoon to check on the Punjabi Sikhs who ran the gas station, using them as a proxy for my parents. Four days after 9-11, Balbir Singh Sodhi, a Punjabi man my father's age, was murdered at his gas station in Arizona by Frank Silva Roque, a white supremacist who shouted, I am a patriot and I stand for America all the way when arrested. So these brown skin and turban were all it took for him to be interpreted as a threat, as a terrorist as someone whose murder was justified. I did not believe my father's flags would keep him safe, but I could not ask him to take them down. I struggled with his assertion of patriotism towards a country that had only shown me ambivalence regarding my existence and simultaneously lived in fear of what might happen to my parents if the Confederate flag wavers of other neighborhoods found their way to our street, so profoundly apolitical and welcoming up to this point. My parents' professional lives as doctors and accountants may have buffered them from the worst of West Virginia's ugly racism before 9-11. I, on the other hand, felt its effects from the age of six, when a chubby, rat-tailed kindergartner approached me in the schoolyard, slapped me across the face, and hit me with the ugliest of racial slurs, illustrating that in West Virginia, there were only two categories that seemed to matter when it came to race, white and not white. And again, when fans of the opposing middle school basketball team screamed Mr. Miyagi and Speedy Gonzalez and where's your papoose each time I walked onto the court, showering me with trash and epithets, then pissed on our school bus at the end of the game. And again, when a high school classmate with his heavily gelled mullet and black Metallica t-shirt pulled over his enormous belly, called me camel jockey and sand nigger every day during shop class and our teacher pretended not to hear him. Until 9-11, my parents did not question their belonging in America. America provided them work, wealth, the opportunity to live a kind of life impossible to imagine in India, and to bring family members in India into its slowly growing middle class. Meanwhile, I, exposed daily to the ugliest manifestations of American ignorance, 
received continu continual reminders that I did not belong. If the flag could protect my parents from this venom and from the thick incapacitating doubt that such venom shuttles to the brain, I would not ask them to take it down. Three, I can't remember when I began to openly flaunt my West Virginia roots, to wear t-shirts emblazoned with images of West Virginia and the lyrics to Country Roads, to proudly share every historical and cultural factoid I had collected during my time living in the state and have continued to collect after leaving. I can, however, remember the first time a white man in West Virginia told me, go back to where you came from. At a gas station in Sissonville in the fall of 1995, in between chugs from his 40 ounce beer bottle. And the second time on the side of the road in Nashville, Tennessee in the summer of 1996, screamed out a car window. And the third time at Ogilvy Park in Wheeling in the fall of 1998, when a leering cowboy held up his hand and said, how? Mocking a Lakota greeting. He asked me what tribe I was from. And when I responded that I was not that kind of Indian, proceeded to spit hate in my face. And again, in the summer of 2019, when the newspaper headlines announced that our white male president scolded a group of black and brown congresswomen using that very same phrase. I hate the way my body responds to acts of racism. Where others are able to stay calm and unaffected or angrily fight back, I simply disintegrate. My eyes blur, my temples pound, and I catalog counter arguments in my mind. But my dry mouth, the fear squeezing my chest cavity, prevents me from saying a word. I want, in those moments, to assert my Americanness, my West Virginianness, to pull out the birth certificate detailing my birth at Thomas Hospital in Charleston, West Virginia, in the heart of the Kanawha Valley. That muddy river valley, those green mountains, those smoking chemical stacks, they are where I come from. So much so that I'm reading this essay to you in a room in my house entirely dedicated to the state of West Virginia. The walls are decorated with a wedding ring quilt, a painting of the New River Gorge, and a map of West Virginia that dates back to the late 1880s. My light source is a lamp from the Blanco glass blowing factory in Milton, 20 minutes from where I grew up. I wanna show my doubters that I'm an expansive encyclopedia of knowledge about West Virginia, most of which I learned in my eighth grade West Virginia studies course or have memorized from the actual West Virginia encyclopedia, my favorite coffee table book. Do you know your state bird and state animal? Mine are the Cardinal and the Black Bear. Can you name every celebrity to come out of your home state? Chuck Yeager was born in Myra long before he flew his plane so fast that he broke the sound barrier. Jerry West was from Shillian, our sneak from Cabin Creek, years before he made the NBA All-Star team 14 times. Walter D. Myers was born in Martinsburg before he became a phenomenal writer for young adults. Henry Louis Gates and his brilliant brain spent their formative years in Kaiser. Randy Moss first played football in the backyards of Rand, and Lou Holtz did the same in Fallensby. And Jennifer Garner wasn't born in West Virginia, but she lived here for most of her childhood before kicking ass on ABC's Alias, where her code name on missions was often Mountaineer. There are Americans whose ancestors have lived in the same state for centuries who don't always know as much about their states as I do. This is a fact. And it's also a fact that knowledge is not the marker of belonging in America that I want it to be. When Congresswomen born and raised in the United States are being told to return to the places they came from on the basis of their skin color and their last names, I find myself questioning when or whether our country will ever see people who look like me, my parent, or my child as American. In the absence of a body that knows how to effectively respond to racism, I wrap myself in my home shirt with the state of West Virginia replacing the O in much the same way that my mother wrapped herself in six yards of silken fabric or my father wrapped himself in the US flag. As though fabric can protect us, as though fabric will make it impossible for angry men to see through the cloth to the skin below. Thank you. I'm happy to take questions um, if you have them and just grateful to you all for being here. Nima, that was fantastic. And we already have a question that has come up. So I'm just going to dive right into it, if that's OK. Yeah. Um, uh, this is a question from Marianne Worthington. And Marianne says, hi, Nima. I love the phrase about your mother at the beginning of that second essay. In such a foreign context, she opted to own her foreignness rather than, to hide, rather than hide it. 
But before 9-11, did your parents encourage you and your siblings to assimilate? Uh, and did they also encourage you to keep your South Asian traditions? Hi, Marianne. Thanks for the question. Folks, if you haven't read Marianne's latest book, The Girl Singer, I highly recommend it. It's an amazing poetry collection that all of you should read. Um, that's a great question. I think the way I would answer it would be to say that my parents did a thing that is pretty well documented among, uh, among South Asian Americans uh, in research that people have done. We didn't have a name for it when I was growing up, but it, when I read it in academic research, I was like, oh, this is what they were doing. And that idea is called accommodation without assimilation, which is to say that I feel like my family and my community were kind of trying to help me figure out how do I navigate dominant culture while also preserving the things about our culture that we really value and are important. So they were never saying to lose or hide or give up. My mom used to give me Gujarati lessons in the basement. I was very stubborn and I was not a good student of those lessons, but they were, you know, like we, we participated in cultural activities really regularly. Um, our, our, it was a small but mighty Indian community that had cultural events really regularly and that was very intentional about creating space for young people to um, learn about culture and engage in cultural activities. So I think that there was always this balance of like preserving and valuing and upholding, but also figuring out how do you navigate dominant spaces um, and how do you do that in ways that that allow you access to those spaces. So I think I think that's the phrase that I would that I I feel like is the one that applies is that idea of like you're accommodating, like you're trying to figure out how do I navigate this dominant space, but that doesn't mean we have to let go of who we are, where we come from. That was a fantastic answer, and also. Um, the questions and compliments keep rolling in and um, RLP and I hope I Arl, I said your name correctly just wanted to tell you that you are a wonderful writer. Oh so, thanks Arl. I appreciate you. Uh, this is a question from Hannah McDonald. What advice would you give to students or families going through tough times, especially dealing with their cultural values that others don't understand or want to hear about? I think that's a really, really good question, Hannah. And I think that um, something that I spend a lot of time talking with my students about is what does it look like for us to really understand our own cultural wealth and all of the wealth that we have in our communities and cultures and to really rest on that as a place of strength um, and to know that there are always gonna be people outside of us who want us to be different than who we are but the more we can learn and the more we can kind of value and appreciate where we come from, uh, the better we're able gonna, better able we'll be to navigate those sort of like pressuring messages or negative messages that are coming from the outside. There are always gonna be haters for better or worse. Um, they're always gonna be there. And so um, the more you can kind of invest in your community uh, and the more you can sort of like rely on that community of people to buffer you and bolster you, I think the better you're able to navigate the haters. All right, we've got another question. This one is from Rosemary Hathaway and she says, both of those essays are incredible. I can't wait to read the whole book. I'm curious to know if there was a specific moment or event that led you to embrace your West Virginia roots and identity, or did it just sort of happen gradually over time? I'd also love to know if you teach your own essays to your students. I hope so. Mm -hmm. uh, the, I'll answer the second question first, which is some of them. Um, I might, there's an essay in this book that's about hair that my students have read. Um, and yes, I definitely try sometimes to share different essays with them if they apply to what we're learning about more broadly. Um, the question about um, if there was a specific moment is an interesting one. Growing up in Appalachia, I did not get the opportunity in school to really read very many Appalachian writers. And I didn't really feel like um, in my education that Appalachian culture or identity were strongly valued. And I think that's an experience that a lot of young people have had in the past and I think sometimes are still having now. Um, and so because of that, I think I was always pretty ambivalent or unclear about my relationship to, to Appalachian identity. And even like adding the additional layer of like 
I'm the child of immigrants. My family only lived in Appalachia for one generation. Like, do I count? I'm not sure. Um, but when I went to college in Pittsburgh, um, people were really negative about Appalachia. There were a lot of people who uh, had very, very disparaging and rude things to say about where I came from. And I think it made me pretty defensive and pretty angry um, because it was like, okay, you're not that far away, first of all. So I'm not sure how you've drawn this magic line that you're not part of Appalachia. But also I felt like there was a lot they just didn't value or understand about where I came from. And so I think it really was in college that I started to sort of like try to make sense of, of that identity and try to understand where I fit in it. And then I think it really just continued to be an evolving process after that. But I also would say that a big impetus for the writing of this book was the publication of another book, um, which I did not like very much, which was called um, A Hillbilly Elegy that came out in 2016 and uh, presented a, a pretty, um, a pretty unrecognizable Appalachia in its pages. Um, it was an Appalachia that I didn't recognize and it didn't feel like it reflected the people who I loved and care about and the people who are from the community that I'm from. And so I think, and then, you know, I was in Boston and all these people in Boston were like reading this book and being like, this is an amazing book. I understand Appalachia in a way I didn't before. And I was sitting there being like, this is not the book that you think it is and it's not doing what you think it's doing. And so that then was a moment where I felt like, well, I'm having these feelings and this anger. And so like, I think I need to assert a different story um, that the story of Indian people growing up in Appalachia is not a story that's going to be told if me or one of the people who grew up with me doesn't tell it. And so that was sort of like another moment of affirming or asserting and saying, not only is it that I have this identity, but I wanna tell the story of this identity, I think is very much related to the publication of that book. So thank you, but no thank you, J.D. Vance. I don't know how to answer that, but definitely a piece of the story. Ah, and uh, Rosemary has a, a follow-up comment. She says, thank you for that all caps exclamation <laughs> point. Uh, I appreciate your clap back at J.D. Vance. All right. Another I'm, question. There is kind of clapping, Rosemary, but we don't need to try. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna hear our clap, but. So another question, this is from RLP again. My mindset of Appalachia has basically been akin to the movie Deliverance. You have forever changed my mindset. Thank you. Earl, I don't think you're alone. And there's a really good documentary that I'd recommend to people. Um, it was on Amazon Prime. I think it's probably still there. It's called Hillbilly. It's by the filmmaker documentarian Ashley York. And she actually does a really amazing job in the documentary of unpacking the stereotypes that have been set forth about Appalachia and why they've been set forth. Um, and really talking about how in mainstream media and popular culture, there is sort of one narrative that gets repeated again and again and again. And so I think a lot of people have a deliverance-esque perception of Appalachia if they haven't been there and they don't know anyone from there and all they're relying on is deliverance and the Beverly Hillbillies and Hillbilly Elegy, like that is not a very broad set of materials from which to extrapolate. So I think um, the, the thing is that like what, what Ashley York does so well in the documentary Hillbilly and is to sort of highlight all of these voices that have been in Appalachia the whole time telling stories of other ways of being and other ways of living and like really building this sort of like rich and diverse definition of like who, who is an Appalachian? What is Appalachian writing? What is Appalachian culture? Um, it's just an awesome documentary for really exploring those ideas further. But I can appreciate that the stereotype is heavy and that a lot of people um, have it because of the way that the region's been represent, represented in media. So some more love from the Q&A. Um, this is from Jamie Thornton. I don't have a question. I would like to add that add that what you must know, you are a wonderful writer. I live in Cannonsburg, PA, 20 minutes from West Virginia. I've recognized some of the characteristics you mentioned. I applaud your writing. Thank you. And shout out to Cannonsburg. I feel like I drove 
drove past that exit a whole bunch on the trips back and forth from Cross Lanes to Pittsburgh um, when I was in school. So I'm gonna ask a question on behalf of some students I was talking to today, um, <clears throat> some young writers, and uh, they asked about process. And so I was hoping maybe you could share with us a little bit today about your writing process. Yeah. Um, lots of writers are like gonna tell you that they're very disciplined and they write a thousand words every morning and you know, you write a thousand words every morning for whatever a year and you have a book. That is not how this book happened. Um, I'm a full-time public school teacher. Um, and so uh, in the Boston Public Schools and my job can be pretty all consuming. Um, and so I am what I would call a binge writer, which is like, I write in fits and spurts. So like, I will marinate on something in my head. I'll take little notes about it in my phone. I'll bullet it out. But like, it's Saturday morning and I'm going to sneak out of bed really early and like sit down for two hours and get the whole thing out. And then I might not be able to touch it again for another three weeks. Right. Or it's the summer and in the summer I can like do a lot and then I'm not going to do anything for a little while. Um, I think the most important thing if you want to write is that you write when you can and how you can and you don't beat yourself up about when you're not writing. Um, and I think sometimes people want want writing to be really a disciplined thing. And I think that's great if you have the privilege and the ability to make it a disciplined thing. And I also think you write how you can write, when you can write, and you do the best you can. And so for me, this book really was written over the course of four years. Um, and I did a lot of things to help myself. Um, I took classes pretty consistently. There's a writing organization in Boston called Grub Street that offers writing workshops. Um, I took a bunch. And so I took them because then it would give me deadlines. And I'd be like, well, I have to write three essays over this nine week span. So it forced me into deadlines. It gave me a, a community of people to workshop my stuff with. Um, it kind of kept me in a writing process. I also did summer um, writing workshops at the Kenyan Writers Workshop and at the Heinemann Settlement School Appalachian Writers Workshop. Again, trying to create space and time to be in community with other writers to give myself a little bit of a schedule and structure for, for producing work and revising work and finalizing it. Um, those are things that I think you have to do when you're working a full-time job that's not a writing job. You have to find the things that are gonna give you some structure and some accountability. And so that's what I did was to sort of try to build that for myself and other spaces. Um, but please, please, please don't be deterred by, by the scary people who say, you know, you gotta wake up at five every morning and write 2000 words before the sun rises. I admire the people who can do that. And I also think there are many different ways to get there and you just have to find your way. I think that is sage advice. And also bless the 5 a.m.ers, but woo, <laughs> that's, a, that's an early wake up call to start writing. <laughs> a couple more questions that came in. Um, so Mary Ann Worthington asks, could you go back to the photo of your family and identify yourself and some of your family members? And that's your book cover, right? <laughs> yep, that is the book cover. So, yep. So I'm this little teeny tiny one in the blue overalls that my mom is trying desperately to hold on to. Um, and I'm trying to run away. And that's my sister Swathi who's sitting beside us. Um, and then the folks in the rest of the image are actually all not blood related to me, but basically might as well be my family because my blood family was 8,000 miles away. And so these are the, this is Shobanti and Yummy Uncle and Naresh Uncle and their kids who are like my siblings and they're like my aunts and uncles. And it is this kind of amazing thing where um, when you don't have blood family around, you build family. And that's what, that's what my parents did. And these are probably some of the most influential people in my, in my growing up. Um, but blood family is just this little corner right here. And everybody else is, um, is, is just like built family. Um, and then yes, Marianne, you're hundred percent right. That is the book cover. Um, it's kind of a funny thing. I was telling um, Renee before we got on here that I, I was asked to send in like ideas for the cover. And so I sent in like some words and phrases and here are artists I really like. And then I was like, I should send this picture um, just as inspiration for the designer. I should send him the picture. So he has this idea in his head. And then the designer was like, I think we should just use the picture. Um, and I think that he's right. 
because I think when you pick this up, like it's very clear very quickly what this story is about. All right, and another question came in. This is from Tommy Chang. Was there a moment or inflection point in your life that motivated you to write this book? Um, it's funny. I think I had started picking at some of the ideas in this book starting in 2016, but the wheels started to turn really fast in the fall of 2018, which is a strange time because professionally, um, that fall, the Boston Public Schools decided that they were going to close my school. Um, and I was in this like really intense period of like activism against my school closing. And somehow that fueled this like need to write all the time, which in my mind, it doesn't make sense to me. Like when I look back on it, I'm like, I'm not sure how this happened because I must have just been going 300 miles an hour. Like, how was I doing both of these things at the same time? But I felt like I had to do both things at the same time. I had to be telling these stories of like identity and community and belonging because the identity, my identity and my community and my place of belonging as an adult, which was my school community was in threat. And so in a strange way, I think that um, school closure and like really having to think about those questions of belonging and community really pushed me to write the stories of growing up and belonging and community. Um, and there's actually one essay in the collection where I try to parallel um, the sort of like my experience of school closure and what that meant about my identity as a as an employee and like what it meant about being a teacher and how you relate to a system with my dad's experience of working at Union Carbide um, during the Bhopal chemical leak, um, where he also had to navigate what does it mean to be an employee of an institution when that institution is doing harm to you or to people who you care about or to communities that you care about. So I think trying to parse those things really pushed me um, further in the writing process. Ah, there we go. Fantastic answers here. Um, you're really sharing so much wisdom with us tonight. Um, so we have another question that, that came up. Um, this is from Catherine Black. Can you talk about coming up queer in Appalachia? Yeah, and Catherine, fair question because neither of the essays really talked about that. That's a hard thing with this collection is there's a lot of intersections and all of them are not present in any essay. Like some essays are more about some things and some essays are more about others. So that is a very fair question. Um, I think that invisibility was a big part of my growing up when it came to the issue of queerness. I think that there were queer people in my community. My fifth grade teacher was definitely queer, but like, did I know it at the time? No. And was she out? Not to us as students. And was queerness something that people were talking about or acknowledging? No. So did I know really early that like my understanding of gender and like the way I was expressing gender didn't match with what people were doing around me. Yes. But did that have a name or like, could I put myself into a context or a community? No. And it actually wasn't until again, I was 18. I was at Carnegie Mellon and I, um, I started organizing to get part of the AIDS quilt brought to campus for world AIDS day, which was just last week. Um, and it turned out that the closest section of the AIDS quilt to Carnegie Mellon's campus was housed in Wheeling, um, Wheeling, West Virginia. And so I was talking to folks in Wheeling and they brought the quilt up and the folks who came were, were queer. And I was really honest with them. And I was like, I, I didn't know any people who were out growing up. And they were like, well, we were there but you didn't know us, right? And so that, I think a lot, I think a lot of my identity development took longer and took me more time to figure out because of the invisibility. Um, and I think that in terms of figuring out how my identity and how my relationship with my partner was going to land on people in the community where I grew up, I also think that was harder and more complicated because there'd been so much silence. It was really hard to interpret or know how people were gonna react. 
Um, and I think in general, when there's silence, our assumption is that silence is negative. And that's not necessarily true. And it hasn't actually been true with a lot of folks from growing up. They've been amazing and wonderful and loving and so happy. Um, but I think that silence in and of itself can be a real challenge and it can make it really hard for people to understand their identity and to figure out how their identity is going to land in a space. And so I think, again, part of the writing of this book is about writing against that silence. And that's, that silence exists in the Indian community and it exists in the Appalachian community. It's not like one of those communities has the trump card there. Like it was cross-cultural silence that was going on and continues to probably go on in some ways. And so it's really about like, how do you figure out your identity in the context of that cross-cultural silence? And then what do you do um, to make sure that that silence doesn't continue for the young people who come after you? And probably one of the most rewarding things that's happened so far, even in just like sharing the cover of the book is all these um, baby queers, and baby brown queers being like, I feel seen. Like I didn't know that there was someone writing a book that was gonna sort of get at some parts of my identity or experience. Like that's been really affirming because that means that for that person, there isn't silence anymore. Um, and I think that's that's probably the best gift we can give somebody. All right, Nima, more uh, love from our audience. Uh, Rebecca Allison says, so proud of you, Nima, and can't wait to read your book. Thanks, Rebecca. And then Brandon McKinney wants to know, where do you teach and what do you teach? Awesome. Thanks, Brandon. So I teach in, in the city of Boston in a neighborhood called Dorchester. Um, and I was a civics teacher for a very, very, very long time. I taught eighth grade civics. But this year, I've actually changed positions. And I'm teaching ninth grade. And I'm teaching a new course, which is called Ethnic Studies which is a course that's all about thinking about your identity and your community and your relationships with people, which has been a real blessing um, and opportunity to sort of dig in deep with young people about questions like the questions in the book and about questions that I didn't get to think about when I was in ninth grade, but I feel like I now as an adult have the ability to create a space where young people can think about those questions. Fantastic. And I'm going to uh, tell folks we're coming up on eight o'clock, um, but we still have time for a question or two. So if you have a question, oh, here, see, you ask and all of a sudden. So um, they're just coming in right and left. So first I'll go with Carol Portnoy, who just says, Nima, you're awesome. <laughs> These are the most fun to read. They yes. really are. So <laughs> some biased people in the chat here. <laughs> um, and then this is from Lindsay at Lingholm, and I hope I said your last name correctly. She wants to know, do you visit West Virginia often? Um, as often as I can, and that is not often enough. Um, my parents moved away from West Virginia in 2003. So up until then, I was obviously going back all the time, um, but they moved away in 2003. And so then um, they moved to Austin, which is where my sister lives. So like when I go to visit family, I'm going to Texas now. But I would try to say I get back at least once a year, sometimes twice a year. Next year, I'm really excited because I think I'm going to probably get back at least three times, which will be lovely and wonderful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, and during the pandemic, obviously, it's been much harder to figure that out. But I was actually just there a couple of weeks ago. I got to go to the Greenbrier for the first time in my life um, with Anne, actually. We, we explored the the hallways of the Greenbrier and got kicked off of a bunker tour um, and did a reading there. And that was a really interesting experience. Growing up in West Virginia, I'd heard about the Greenbrier all the time. I had never seen that very unique space. And so, yeah, that was that was my first time back in a little bit, but I have, I'll be in Morgantown in, in March. And so I'm excited to kind of keep getting back now. We're excited to have you keep coming back now. So uh, this is from Jessica Madden, and I think it's Fuoco. Um, again, apologies if I get your name incorrect. Um, you are all heart and hustle, Nima. Can't wait to read your book. If you were to tell young people how to maintain heart and hustle during this time, what would you say? Uh, I would say that it's really important for young people to cleave to their own sense of what feels right to them, because a lot of adults right now are very off track 
I think that a lot of adults are really fixated on this idea of like returning to some idea of normal. Um, and I think that the way we were doing normal before the pandemic didn't work for a lot of young people. And I think normal works even less well for young people now than it did before. And I think the reality is that like uh, we as adults are really messing things up for young people who are coming after us in a lot of ways. Um, we are not leaving them a world that we should be leaving them. And so they, they really need to, to sort of like dig into what they think is important and what they value and, and to push those things forward and not be scared about demanding what they need um, because yeah, we're, we're just not doing it for them. Uh, they got to ask us for a lot more than, than, than we're giving them right now. And they have to not be scared to do that. So Rosemary Hathaway wants me to let you know Congrats on getting kicked off the bunker tour. Uh, and Kate Fussner. I think has, Anne should get the, I mean, kicking <laughs> Anne Pancake off the bunker tour. I was like, wow, guide, you're bold. You don't know. <laughs> you don't know who you're kicking off the tour right now. The two of you together seem like a, like a do not kick off tour force, but uh, I've never given a bunker tour. So. Uh, Kate Fussner has a question that I think is just great. Nima, three exclamation points. What are you reading right now? What writers are inspiring you? Well, um, I just finished Anthony Doerr's book, Cloud Cuckoo Land, which was just incredible. Um, I read a lot of fiction, I, especially when school is going on. I feel like I, my brain is more open to fiction um, than to other things. So I, I let my brain do that. But um, Cloud Cuckoo Land is a masterpiece and a real lesson in like um, what the level of work a writer can do and the level of research and effort that they can put into the writing of a book because it is just pulling together a lot of worlds and a lot of ideas in a really, really incredible way. And it's just, I think, a lesson in, you know, taking your time to tell the story and not rushing it and letting the story kind of being okay with the fact that like you don't need to publish a book a year like you can take the time to go slow and let the story come and do the research needed to really give a give us give a book it's it's worth um so that was a pretty awesome read and then um poetry i really really loved um reginald Dwayne betts new poetry collection felon i highly recommend it it's an incredible collection about um the experience of incarceration so those are the two things i've been reading lately Nima, if you're exhausted, you earned it because you answered 17 questions this evening, which I think is, is a Humanity Center record. So um, thank you so much for your reading, for your generosity with all these answers. Um, and uh, we're all really, really excited for your book to come out this March. Um, I, I'm just really um, excited that we got to host your first uh, book event. And uh, thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you all for being here. It was really, really lovely to share it with you. And um, I look forward to sort of hearing more from you. Feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put my website in the, well, I can't put it in the chat, but I can share a screen. Um, if you want to check out any of the other essays, or you just want to send me a note, you're welcome to go to my website. It's just myname.com. Um, and you can contact me there. And I'd love to hear from you. And thanks, Renee and Anne and everybody at the Center for Humanities for um, making this possible. I really appreciate you all. Thank you. And to wrap up tonight, um, I just want to remind you that uh, the WV Humanities Center uh, thanks you for attending tonight's event and remind you that we began with humanities programming starting on January 24th, 2022 at 7 p.m. via Zoom with On Many, A Vase and Jar, Orientalism in Ballet with Phil Chan, a former dancer and current choreographer, activist, and author of Final Bow for Yellow Face. And for a full listing of our events, please check out our website or contact us at humanitycenter at mail.wvu.edu to be added to our monthly newsletter. Uh, thanks again, stay safe and have a wonderful rest of 2021.